Hello, everybody. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I am executive director of All Brains Belong Vermont. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm going to turn on our backup recording. So, recording in progress. All right, let me share screen and I'll get us oriented. So tonight we will be continuing our conversation on the double empathy problem, this time in healthcare. So, um, and, and uh, if, if that's a new term for you, don't worry, we will, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna recap what last week was about and then we'll build from there. Um, but first, just by way of introduction, Brain Club is our intentionally created education space for our collective All Brains Belong community for purposes of educating about neurodiversity and topics related to inclusive community. Um, uh, just, just to name that this is for education purposes only, this is not a support group, and this is not for medical or mental health advice. We have other programs for those things, but this is an education program. And all forms of participation are okay here. As many of you have figured out, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to look at the camera. So feel free to, you know, walk, move, fidget, stim, eat, take breaks, you know, anything, anything goes. And everyone is welcome here, adults, kids, pets. Uh, so just um, keeping, especially since a lot of, a lot of folks do keep their video off, we just always kind of keep, um, ass assume there might be little ears in the background. Um, so, um, all forms of communication are okay. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat, whatever you're most comfortable with. And um, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's really important that we respect and protect the group's collective access needs. And, um, and as it relates to individual access needs, um, if there's any reason you're uncomfortable for any reason, um, we do have direct messaging enabled. Um, Lizzie, our education programs coordinator, will see a direct message a lot sooner than, than I will. Lizzie, can you, are, you, are you available to, to wave? Amazing, that's Lizzie again. Um, so just let Lizzie know so that we can brainstorm how to how to um, make some adjustments. Um, speaking of access needs, it's really important to us to be able to cue safety for a broad range of communicators. And so since many of our community members benefit from uh, processing time, space to join the conversation, um, so we'll, we'll pause intermittently to give people a chance to join however they would like to. And remembering that observation is a completely valid form of participation. Okay, last bit of access needs uh, related intro. Um, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the, uh, the live transcript closed captioning icon. And if you don't, um, try the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. And um, if you want to turn them off, do the same thing and choose hide subtitles. And that is my visual support to open up the chat. So if people are using it, I'll be able to see it. Okay. Um, so as I said, um, this month at Brain Club, we are discussing the double empathy problem. My, I'm doing something funny with my screen. There we go. Okay. Um, so last week, we discussed perspective taking in relationships and some of the challenges there within. Today, we'll be talking about a different type of relationship, a relationship between clinician and patient. So what's a double empathy problem? Double empathy problem is a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who's an autistic social scientist in the UK. Um, uh, over a decade now, um, there's been consistent research that supports the double empathy problem, which is there is not one normal set of social skills. And then the autistic people over there who don't have those social skills. It's that when there is a mixed neurotype, when there is a mismatch between communication style, between worldviews, that's where communication breakdowns happen. So in Dr. Milton's original studies, looking at um, autistic people communicating with one another um, and non-autistic people communicating with one another, and turns out that both groups struggled to um, be able to communicate when there was that mismatch of communication style and worldview. 
So what's the consequences this um, uh, when it when it relates to health care? Um, you know, this data is about autism, but this is not specific to autism. Um, this applies to a much broader audience. Um, what we know is that autistic adults have a very difficult time accessing health care. Um, almost 80% of autistic adults have difficulty accessing primary care amongst people who already have a primary care practice. Like, it's not like they're trying to find people who take new patients. It's like, I have a practice, but I can't access the care. 80% of autistic adults. And not surprisingly, high rates, um, 63 to 69% untreated health conditions. Can access health care? Of course, you're going to have more untreated health conditions. And only about a third of autistic adults report having a good relationship with a primary care physician, despite um, more than 70% of the same people thinking that it would be important to have a good relationship with a primary care physician. And um, more than a third of autistic adults don't even tell their primary care physician that they're autistic because of fear of judgment. And what we know is that the barriers to care are extensive. So um, we're going to be talking about the provider-related barriers today, um, but everything's all connected. So in the environment, you know, the, the, the aspects of the interaction related to sensory processing, communication, the systemic barriers, you know, there's so many defaults in the healthcare system. You must pick up the phone to become a new patient. Um, um, you must, um, you know, fill out the 20-page packet um, you must, you know, you must fit into the boxes. You must show up in the 15 minute visit and somehow convey really complex things going within your body. Um, it's not just autistic people. The healthcare system doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, and um, in this study of autistic adults, there is a widespread experience perceiving that healthcare providers have insufficient knowledge and skills and unhelpful attitudes as an independent barrier to healthcare access. Training is not very good. Um, so this is a study um, from Zerbo et al. in 2015. It's one of my favorite studies. And by favorite, I mean that like fairly sarcastically. Um, this is a study of primary care physicians Less than 10% of primary care physicians would, would suspect that their patient were autistic if they volunteer information, shows interest in people, discusses emotions, and can see the whole picture. That's what's, that's what's out there. And um, I think that while in 2023, it's very encouraging that we have many clinicians um, that 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 have been, you know, accessing healthcare trainings from Aubrey's Belong, for example. There's lots of people who are um, who who are really engaged and looking to learn new things. And this was not part of original medical education for a lot of clinicians. And um, when you're only trained in stereotypes, that's what you see when you're out there in the world unless you're prepared to do a lot of unlearning and relearning. And um, that tunnel vision, that really narrow look um, at, at autism, at even like, you know, the, 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 the underlying physiology that autistic and ADHD people have, like there's just so much tunnel vision, so much fragmentation in the healthcare system. It's, it, it, it really, it's, um, like, I, like I like to say, it's like Google Maps. When you're so zoomed in, you don't know what continent you're on. When you zoom way out and you recognize that everything's connected to everything. And what we know is that neurodivergent people have a pattern, a pattern of intertwined medical conditions. Um, and in fact, next week, that's what, that's what uh, we'll be discussing at next week's um, brain club it's we're still calling it brain club but it's actually um a, a it's 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 not going to be a typical brain club it's going to be a oh there you go um it's going to be a um I, I would expect a larger audience than our typical brain club it'll be more webinar style you know may, maybe some time for conversation but mostly mostly a, a, a um 
uh, a one way, more of a one way type presentation on this process, which is the pattern of intertwined medical conditions that autistic and ADHD people very, very commonly experience. Oh, <laughs> I, I made a slide about that. So yes, so if you're not signed up for that already, Lizzie, can you drop in the chat? It's free, just like any other brain club. Um, uh, if you're if you're not signed up already, we would love for you to join us next week for our webinar about this process that um, is not part of standard medical education. And so, you know, at All Brains Belong, we know that everything's connected to everything. And as we have been reimagining healthcare through community connection. That it's that 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 health and health care is not just medical care. It's addressing social isolation. It's supporting employment. It's about training the wider community, healthcare providers, employers, you know, like trying to make the environment actually meet people's access needs. That's part of health too. Um, and when we think about the systemic barriers that thwart neurodivergent people because of unmet access needs, healthcare, medical care, um, there's a lot of that. And so um, we're going to play a video, I think it's about 30 minutes, um, where the clinicians at All Brains Belong, we recorded ourselves having a conversation about our own learning and unlearning process, how we as professionals have been navigating this journey of dealing with the, the, the healthcare system barriers, um, unlearning some of our medical education, and applying what we learn from our community toward providing healthcare for patients. So with that, David, take it away. The theme of the month is neurodivergent health. You know, as 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 I, I think we sh I think I think we should share with our audience that you know not all our patients are neurodivergent, um, and certainly not all our patients I would identify as being a neurodivergent, um, uh, and they come because their needs were not met by the traditional healthcare system. That's what they have in common. Right. That's what they all have in common, um, and amongst that group, um the overwhelming majority of our patients have this pattern, right, of neuroimmune conditions. Um, I think they most often talk about not feeling listened to or heard. Um, and I know that's kind of a vague thing, but um, I think being, feeling like they're having their symptoms dismissed, whether that's because, oh, you're young and no, you shouldn't, you can't be in that much pain. You can't have this thing or, um, oh, this disorder is so rare. You couldn't have it. Um, I was talking to another provider about, you know, yeah. neurodivergent healthcare and how common, how some medical conditions tend to coexist and that there's like actual literature and papers out there about it. And this is someone who's probably like five to 10 years my senior, like they've been in practice that much longer than me and they had no idea they're right. like i didn't know that you know these things happen together um and so i think the issue is that these things are not on people's radar that because it's not being taught right so let's start there so what do what do you remember um if anything, about what you were taught about autism and ADHD? Nothing. I had no idea they could coexist. Yeah. I was never taught that they could co coexist. Yeah. Despite, yeah. they almost, like, they, they, they coexist more often than they don't. Right. Yeah. I feel like, for me, autism education was, like, developmental milestones and m chat and that type of stuff for kids and then adhd was this happens in kids and we use stimulants to treat it 
and then yeah they that, were like... very they were separate i mean i was not taught that autistic physiology was different than non-autistic people's physiology like I was taught, I mean, like, so, I mean, there was, there, there was like, so, you know, the deficit based paradigm of like, you know, here are the things that, that are wrong. Um, and, and we call this autism, um, in kids, there was never a discussion about autistic adults. Um, I don't know, like, I don't think that I had any ideas about autistic adults, despite being one and not knowing. Um, but like, I, uh, like, like it was just never on the radar that like there were autistic adults, let alone the medical conditions that people have. So like when the list of all the co-occurring conditions, these are all things that kids had. Um, there was also like, you know, the, 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 the medical conditions that all the autistic kids had they were it was very strongly implied if not explicitly taught to me that there was it was like patient blaming you know like you have gastrointestinal things because you you only eat chicken nuggets and pasta and you don't exercise so that's why you're constipated like not that you have right. stretchy colons that get all get, get all stretched out right Par increased periodontal disease because of not doing oral hygiene right 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 i mean and this is this is more systemic right in the in the healthcare system but the the zoomed in uh, style of teaching like you know there's psychology psychiatry and there's gastroenterology and there are all these things that are separated and but mm -hmm. in reality there are so many things that are interconnected that it's it's silly that we are not taught more of a like zoomed out picture. This is like a an entire being that is has multiple systems that actually work together and rely on each other and are influenced by like how your DNA is being transcribed. And um, it's it's just it's unfortunate that that zoomed out more of that zoomed out approach to teaching medicine isn't taught because it results in the in the zoomed in like looking at these two things that you already know coexist and not seeing the the bigger connections with some of these other things and how um you know how that impacts people in the healthcare system impacts patients in particular yes and i think that what you said is really interesting because i i think that I would describe my medical education as being very top down. An autistic patient is more likely to have X, Y, and Z list of conditions. Top down, you memorize the associations and they're tested on board exams. But that's not how the patient comes in. The patient comes in bottom up. And in a healthcare system that is so fragmented, like you said, um, The opportunity, the pattern is not created in a zoomed out enough approach. The pattern is created way, way too, and even even people with the type of brains that are really good at pattern matching, the 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 the, the whole picture of the pattern was not taught because it's not known. And one of the reasons it's not is that. These these patients are thought to be rare, right? So so if if what's described is that two percent of adults are autistic, I mean, there's zero chance that that's true. It would need to be more than that. Um, but anyway, it's thought to be it's thought to be rare. So why would we make why 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 would medical education be structured on this entity that is that is rare because they're because what's missed is that the neuroimmune conditions that are more common in autistic and ADHD people are connected to the things that are known to be very common. So, you know, when we think about like in our practice, right, how we, we see a lot of mast cell dysfunction and guess what? That's connected to diabetes and hypertension and like all the things, right? So, so right. And IBS and mood uh anxiety migraine. I mean, migraines 
it's connected to everything, but yet yeah, not zoomed out enough to really. I think that's what primes primary care providers for doing this type of work is because theoretically they're the ones who are already doing that kind of like look at the full body and the full patient and they're the ones who are seeing all the different things that are going on and know the patient longitudinally longitudinally enough um to theoretically be able to kind of see the connection between everything but what i would say is that um even though we have a a population of clinicians who are ideally poised to spot the pattern. We have a medical system, a healthcare system that is thwarting primary care clinicians to have full access to their cortex, right? Like, so we have this, like, this healthcare system that is forcing primary care clinicians to see, you know, a, a patient every 10 minutes. Um, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And Most practices are 15 minute visits for follow ups, 30 minute visits for new patients, or, you know, uh, wellness exams or whatever. And on top of that, you're managing an, an electronic medical record system and paperwork and interpersonal work stuff. It's like you, you have, you have five, five or 10 jobs within one job already. And so not, not, I, I don't want to, there's no, the blame is the system. I don't think that people go into medicine intentionally wanting to dismiss people at all, but it's just, it's something that ends up happening. You know, you're exhausted, you're tired, you, you didn't eat breakfast, you didn't have time to eat lunch. And then you're, and then you just, you lose, um, um, what's it called? You get dysregulated but on there's, there's a line that, that happens and you're like, backed up against a wall and feel like you you know in some some ways it may be the provider kind of um advocating for their own access needs by saying okay we don't have time to talk about this today but not knowing that that that's how that makes someone feel you you don't have the cognitive resources to do what needs doing in that moment because the system is thwarting you and so you you're anyway you don't have the ability in that moment to zoom out, because that's an executive function, it's like a higher order brain skill, to zoom out, to self-monitor, to know like what you're saying, how you're saying, your tone, your body language, all of this stuff. And I right. think that there's a lot of, you know, really inadvertent um, communication breakdowns. That yeah, yeah, unintentional dismissiveness. Yeah. I think like what we, what I, what I hear a lot, like when we have new patients, you know, the overwhelming majority of our patients have this pattern, right, of neuroimmune conditions, um, that, that there is physiology that explains these multi-organ system symptoms. People show up and they have like this laundry list of diagnoses um, and like, why would it make sense that a human being would have like 40 things wrong with them? Um, you know, turns out, you know, their connective tissue is different. Um, it's, it's just a different way of being wired. And it just so happens that these physical health conditions, which, you know, are, are, are exacerbated by dysregulation. And when your access needs are thwarted by like, you know, all of the systems, um, this actually drives like a worsening of neuroimmune conditions. But people don't right. know that. Nobody yeah. knows that. Yeah. They just like feel broken and they're told that they are broken and then they're like shamed for seeking help. So like, anyway, shame for seeking help, shamed for seeking help in the way that you authentically communicate when you seek help. And shamed for not complying with recommendations that don't work for your brain. Right. When, 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 when we hear their story, they can trace this back for like decades, right? Like decades. Yeah. Um, and it's about having the, the opportunity to share your story in the way that works for you.
So some people need to info dump their story with math words. Some people need to bring a list. <laughs> yes, right, they, right, they, right. They're the patient <laughs> with the list, right? The one that's like shamed and othered by the healthcare system. They, yeah. they wrote that list, and that list is incredibly important because because it has all the information in it. Like anyway, there's some people like you know we we have a patient who I'll never forget. A new patient visit you know, brought a mind map that showed me like, you know, all the things that like, this makes it worse, this makes it better. And I'm like, I know that pattern, right? So like, if you get the, if you get the patient's information in like their, so say like in their native tongue, like in their, in yeah, the way that, yeah. in the way that they best communicate, you get a ton more information, but the system thwarts patients from communicating. The people come in, I think the other thing that I often see, especially with kids coming in, with neurodivergent kids especially is just that they have not been able to um access care in other settings um just due to the like sensory overload of the specific setting um and so yeah whether it's like providers not um knowing their sensory needs beforehand before actually coming into the visit or like just before walking into the room um oh whether it's um like the fluorescent lights whether it's thinking that they're going to need a vaccine the entire visit and being anxious and not interacting the entire visit until they know they don't need one at the end um and that's why i like having the like information before a visit of what somebody needs what their sensory needs are because starting off the visit that way makes such a huge difference and if we didn't have that i wouldn't know necessarily well um you left something out how do we have that information we asked right like like that's that's the thing right so if you ask people what makes them comfortable and you ask and you and like you try to do those things they usually have a better healthcare experience. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just the systems within the systems already have like there's right. their standard expectation. Like this is how you communicate. This is how you take information. Like, you know, people, people teach you how to, how to take notes. Like yes. when you're in, when you're in school, here's how, here's how you study something without ever knowing how your brain works. Like, and and then you try to fit yourself and mold your brain and your way, your whole way of being into the box that who knows who designed it, but the box that has become like the, the standard expectation of how, how to communicate, how to interact, how to socialize, how to just exist, how to be within the workplace. Um, and and it's 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 suffocating. Yeah. I mean, I remember even like as a pre-med student, like, you know, my volunteer gigs or like some of my jobs after college before medical school, like it was just so clear that there was judgment going on and that that what you just said, like, you know, that there's one right way to do the thing. There's wrong, like, like it was just so clear that it was not okay to show up as as one's true self not not just as as a professional like as a patient like i remember being like a young 20 something and i remember being like you know oh i like i have to do something i have to do something to make sure they don't think i'm weird or that i'm like melodramatic or that you know anyway i have all the things i have all the things i've always had all the things um I, I, as a patient i've never you know I, I i've never had care for my all the things because i never tell anyone my all the things because that's a surefire where to get judged <laughs> yes not because it's funny it's just it's 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 one of those it's just act in this way communicate in this way or you will go unheard yes like you have to you have to communicate a certain way or or you you won't be heard and not everybody can make that adjustment and so those are the those are the people that are staying away from healthcare because it's overwhelming or confusing or un uncomfortable or unsafe to yeah See, yeah. I feel like I see that so commonly. Like if if I'm talking to somebody about like being in a pre-diabetic range and before I even say anything, they start with, but I 
eat well and I've been struggling with my weight in my entire life and like preface it with like I'm doing all the things please don't blame it on me being at fault or or blame it on my weight um and it's just so ingrained in patients to kind of preface a visit with these are all the things that I'm doing because otherwise it's so common for it to because that's how we learn that's we learn that diabetes is lifestyle factor related and that's the only thing versus inflammation and genetics and all the other things and mast cells to do to it right right and that like weight isn't always totally changeable well it's also that like i mean i mean this is this is like such a bigger picture like so not only is there a right way to be a person but like the message that there's a right way to be healthy too. And like, so, you know, when you think about like all of the anti-fat bias and shaming that goes on in the healthcare system, I mean, it starts in childhood. I mean, it's just, it's, yeah. it's so bad. Yeah. I think shame, shame is unfortunately one of those, one of those things that is, I, I don't even know why either taught from the very beginning, mm -hmm. you know, as children. I wish that it were normalized to say when you don't know. Instead, what is modeled or what was modeled for me as a trainee is that you fake it till you make it. And that when someone says a thing that doesn't match your worldview, you quackify them. Well, that's not a thing. Um, I remember hearing in medical school, um, and thankfully I had a nutritional biochemistry background. So they said that taking vitamins is just paying for really expensive pee. And I was like, they were like, well, why would they say that? Because they stopped taking the vitamins because they felt guilty and shame. And I was like, be because they don't know biochemistry they don't they don't understand that nutritional needs of different humans are, are just as different as the brains that are operating so instead of saying i don't really understand how the human cell and mitochondria and all of these different vitamins and minerals interact so i'm going to say that um taking vitamins is stupid you can get enough from what you eat and um and then, and then I'm going to teach that to people that are training under me who are then going to say these things to patients. And we all just don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> yep. I remember being taught that people, quote, outgrow ADHD. Kids outgrow ADHD. And, you know, I believed that. I was taught it despite being, a, you know, an undiagnosed adhd -er. Like, anyway, that kind of mythology is just so widely held it's the same way like i remember as a trainee you know the pa the, the patient with the list um and like i thought that was awesome because i'm a visual processor and i wanted to read the list and um uh but but anyway that person gets shamed but also like the patient that comes in and says you know i read about this on you know webmd or some other website and like i read this article and i want you to like you know how does this fit into my like i I don't know, I just always thought that was awesome because they like they were engaged in their health. And anyway, it 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 doesn't it's it's not that hard to be like, I don't know about this. Thanks for the article. I'll read it and we can talk about it again next time. It's not that hard, but that's not modeled. The opposite of that is 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 modeled. But like right. in the context of what we talked about before, where the system is like, you know, you must see the patient every 10 to 15 minutes. Like, so now I have something else to do. Right. So, it's 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 <laughs> unfortunately i think within the medical community it's learned behavior and learned behavior from maybe you know someone else's teachings that the list is bad and those those patients are compl complicated and you know the eye rolling and and all that kind of stuff it's all it's it's learned we weren't we weren't taught how to how to really manage that you know yeah. as a you know um well just see them more often right wow okay right right it's that easy it is that easy and i think like coming back to the like 
not feeling comfortable saying you don't know things like there's this expectation that a healthcare provider is a knows everything about every single body system and that's that's not feasible for anybody i think i mean i right. certainly don't know everything about every body system like primary care is really hard and right yeah primary care is really hard there's so much to know there's so much to spot you're on the front lines and then you have the system thwarting you your ability to do what you're trying to do for your patients um you don't have full access to your cortex and you're trying to survive and like it, it feels a lot like treading you know it's like it, treading water and like trying trying to survive and trying to do everything you can for your patients um there's just it's so much yeah and i think for those in traditional primary care practices um whether you're hospital owned or private i mean what's normalized is the dysfunction of the system it's yeah. like yep this is just the way it is so you know so that's what we have to do so we're just going to keep yeah. doing it and uh just felt like there has to be a better way to do this but like everyone's stuck it's a failure of imagination right so like what we do all day i mean the only reason we're really able to do it is because we don't have a bureaucracy like the patients need a thing and we kind of like try to figure out how to do that thing um and like a system systems get dysfunctional i mean like i think individual providers are most frequently operating in systems where they don't have autonomy or agency to do a lot of things like when i do trainings for like in services for healthcare practices um or even like it you know conferences like people are like oh yeah that's really great that you can do that thing in your in your special setting um but like you know us 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 people in the trenches um you know what what what, what about us and it'd be good to, to to wrap up maybe talking about like what are some things not just like you know what are the medical conditions we manage and how do we manage them but like what are some like what are some things we do that are free to do that like i don't know are different than 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 in other settings because i think that one of the things that we do is i think we we teach patients that they are the experts in their own bodies many of them don't know that this is like new information that they're getting that lens is really a requirement for for trusting your intuition, for connecting all the dots, for learning about your access needs and naming it when they're not met. If you don't think that you're the expert in your own self, because you got messages to the contrary your whole life, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely, um, definitely makes a big difference. I think as a practice, us, you know, before patients even come in, we're asking them, before they even become our patient, they know that we care about how they learn information, how they would like visits to go. Giving people uh, choices of sensory needs and ways to access care and a lot of those are free like turning off the fluorescent lights in an office um or letting people bring fidgets and whatever they want with them and making that explicit that like you can bring whatever you want with you having things in the office for people to be able to write their own notes so they don't have to bring their own things I think we uh, we often get feedback, right, that patients have never been asked for what they need. But the fact that we asked means that we care, and that makes right. that patient that much more comfortable to share things in their, like, authentic, unique way. Right. And the fact that, you know, like like you said before, Gabe, about how, you know, we were trained to ask questions a certain way. 
Like, guess what? There are some brains who can't answer questions in the way that they're being asked in that default way. And so, like, just the idea of, you know, open-ended questions do not work for all brains. And the idea of providing people with a menu for examples of, like, these are, these are things we offer all people with all types of brains. And you can let us know if any of these things would be helpful to you. And it's not because you have you know, an issue. You don't have a sensory issue or a communication issue. It's that you would just find these things helpful to have available to you. That's all. The other thing that I think that I've learned in this past year and a half is that like about just the idea of healthcare as community. Mm. And I yeah. think I think that has really, really stayed with me because I think I think that's what I think that's what one of the one of the key things that we're doing. I mean, like it's not for everybody. That's why if we try to be really transparent about the model here and you know have people not not join, not come when they're not looking for this model. But remember at my my old practice in a traditional setting, I remember meeting with people back to back who were, had no friends, totally socially isolated. And it was like, they actually like loved the same things. And like the healthcare system says that you, you know, HIPAA, you know, you can't do anyway, but like, turns out like they can introduce themselves to one another. If you build a forum that they would both come to. Like, think about how much we have learned from patients, like coming as this, as this, as this village. Like when we think about like, all these really complicated medical conditions that most of the healthcare system doesn't understand. When you bring patients together and you give people an opportunity to describe in their own ways what their experience is like and what helps and does not help, people feel alone. They feel just alone in their lives. Was that the end, David? Yeah, I showed the ending of it. That was the end. Yeah. It seemed anticlimactic. Anyway, <laughs> who knows? Maybe I cut something off when I posted it or something. Anyway, um, thank you. So lots of really thoughtful comments in the chat all throughout. And I really appreciate everybody engaging with this and sharing so many of their experiences. Um, there's, um, you know, there's, a, there's, there's so, there's so much suffering out there in the world. There's so many people who feel invalidated, dismissed, misunderstood by the healthcare system. And um, you know, I, I it, it was our goal in creating that video to um, invite consideration of the healthcare system as villain, not the individual clinician, because when we have a system that thwarts the clinician from having their own access needs met, how would they have access to their cortex to like do the hard work of zooming out, to do the hard work of perspective taking, do the hard work of adapting communication. Um, it's like everything we talk about in Brain Club about what's hard for us to do when we don't have access to our cortex, at least not fully. And so, you know, I think that like we talk about so many different systems that are designed to perpetuate the systems that end up thwarting all the people in them. Um, the healthcare system is a really good example of that. I wonder if anyone has thoughts about that. Have like ha have have you ever thought about um, for those who've had 
negative. Negative is like, you know, understatement of century, negative healthcare experiences, you know, like, like painful, harmful, like all the things, healthcare experiences. Um, when viewed through the lens of the system, does that help? Does that help your own narrative of what happened? Maybe not, but I'm just curious. So we got a thumbs up from Monique. I don't know how many, hi Amanda, to your pronouns. And this is my first time though I've come across Melhauser in doing some other research stuff. Um, and I, because I was in training like MD PhD track before I got really sick in my slew of all the things. Um, I had, I already knew the kind of grinding pace that especially for-profit healthcare puts on providers. So I, yeah, it absolutely, it didn't make it any less hurtful, but the source of the pain was certainly shifted. It wasn't like, oh, this specific provider doesn't like me or doesn't listen to me. It was easier to understand I am one of 40 patients that this doctor has to see just today and that they are being evaluated. They are having their time limited. Um, and so it was helpful in that I didn't take it as personally, um, but it also made it in some ways more painful because I was like, well, if it were just an issue of getting this doctor to listen to me, then maybe if I switch doctors, it would be better. Or maybe if I find the right combinations of words, it'll be better. But the fact that it's just a crushing system makes it a lot harder to fight as a singular patient. So you're like, well, actually now I need insurance to change their compensation structure and I need the department to change the RVUs per provider and... I can't do that on my own. Amen to all of that. Thank you for sharing. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of discussion around, you know, so, like healthcare reform as though like if reimbursement for things were adjusted, like that, that would make it all okay. Like it's, it's, it's so much, it's, it's such a big system. It's a big system that, um, you know, for, 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 you know, all the, like, I, th I think about like when I began my medical training, like I was so enamored of patient centeredness, the healthcare system can't possibly be patient centered. The healthcare system is, is, is oriented around how efficient um, how, you know, an efficiency, like, you know, any other kind of like factory work is, it's cookie cuttered. And I don't think that's how healthcare has to be. Just reading in the chat, um, Bruno says the healthcare workers are just as stuck in the system as we are as patients. Um, but often I'm left confused, not understanding, and are traumatized and invalidated. Yeah. It's such a common sentiment. Yeah, and as Sierra says, it's not just the healthcare system. To improve health, you have to improve everything else. You know, at All Brains Belong, um, it, it's, 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 it's very common that our patients come in and are describing, like, what's going on at school and what's going on at work. And like those environments are also thwarting people. And so like to improve health, we are also strategizing around improving their experiences in those places because that's part of health. Um, I wanted to say something about one thing I don't understand uh, that 
still exists is the BMI. Um, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole about where that came from. And it was a mathematician that dabbled in sociology uh, that also believed in eugenics. And we still use it. Like, <laughs> that there was no real medical basis to BMIs and the numbers that this mathematician came up with. Thank you for sharing that. Like, I remember even like as a medical student, actually like probably as in a pre-med, like I remember like very early in my trajectory as a physician being like, this makes no sense. This is ridiculous. Um, but I did not know the story about its origins and, um, Thank you for sharing that. I think that's really important. It's kind of like how, um, I don't know, for those of you who were at our April webinar on the healthcare system's role in perpetuating the stigma of autism, um, when I, I told the story of how autism made its way into the DSM. That's also not, it, it, that's also a story of really gross and horrible things. And like these details are really important um, and they're not known. the comments in the chat with 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 more details on um on BMI um so its originator interested in the systems of perfection including the math of bodies and the orbits of planets how did I not know this story that's so messed up yeah, and as Sarah's saying, BMI is linked to shame for many. Like there's, you know, healthcare and shame. There's so much shame that people go through. Um, and and I think that like we talk about with with so many other aspects of shame where the power of naming the thing, having someone else say me too, and that that for so many people makes a difference because shame breeds um, in, in isolation. And if you, if a person has an experience of being shamed in the context of healthcare, um, often people think they're the only ones and they feel extra broken and defective and deficient and all of that. Hi, Mel. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to stick with my tradition of speaking up in these webinars. Um, I am uh, late 50s and just recently uh, had was affirmed in my autism, even though I knew for this is a common story, right? That I knew longer. Anyways, um, I'm at the point of um, trying to unravel all the internalized uh, how I have intern. I ignore myself when I am ill or unwell, or a new symptom shows up, or something quirky is going on with my body, or I'm I'm set in a way that isn't supporting me. Um, I am at the stage of reparenting I don't know what the word is deconditioning myself in the ways that I have been conditioned by um, the medical system and um, yeah it, it boy it's a lot of things huh it's all the things and a lot of things <laughs> and it's uh, but I'm, I'm at that stage and, and then yeah I got nothing else to say there that's me <laughs> yes um, and 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 so many people in our village um, are going through very similar processes. And you know, I think at All Brains Belong, um, you know, it, it our, our staff, our team is often reflecting on, you know, like I said, like systems drive systems. Um, and you know, we've we've really been very intentional about doing it differently. We've all been in other 
types of healthcare environments and you know that doesn't work it didn't work for us didn't work for patients does anyway um so but 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 when you are um when you are like in in twat like i don't know what the word is you're like having to interact with these systemic structures that don't work um you can see how they're big and they're powerful and they like make you think you have to do things in certain ways that you have to be really intentional about not doing and as an independent practice that consisting of humans who have autonomy over our practice like you got to imagine that in an era where most healthcare is provided in hospital and systems individual clinicians don't have that autonomy and so like we talk about so often at brain club autonomy is an access need for many people But we've been, we've been really encouraged. We've been encouraged um, that reimagining healthcare has, in many ways, like yeah, healthcare is complicated, um, but it also doesn't need to be. So when we think about the premise of there's no right way to be a person. You offer everything you do in multiple different ways. Give people freedom and choice to pick what works for them you name that people have been through a lot of bad past experiences and that you want to understand that and you want to understand what stresses people out so that you don't do that and you want to understand what makes you feel comfortable so that you can do those things on purpose it doesn't have to be that complicated Oh, and you connect people to other people because social isolation is really bad for health. And so commonly, you know, people come here because their needs were not met by the traditional healthcare system. And, you know, not only, you know, do maybe people find that they have all the things, or maybe people find that they're neurodivergent, but they also find a community. They find other people who are going through what they're going through. And they feel a lot less alone and a lot more hopeful. And so with that, um, we're very excited next week um, because not only will we be giving you a tour of the All the Things project and the free resources on that site, um, you know, that if wherever you wherever you get your health care, these are resources that can help you advocate for your own health care. Um, and oh, thank you, Lizzie, for popping that in the chat. Um, and, um, you know, it, I think a lot of, you know, it, it's a, a, just a disclaimer. Our, our team really wanted to, for those of you who are Brain Club regulars, this, this is not going to feel like Brain Club. This is going to feel like a completely separate thing there are 112 people registered so far who knows if people will come um but you know we think this is an opportunity to teach a lot of people about all the things because there's a lot of people who need to know about all the things and if they are um a clinician they need to know about this if they are a patient they need to know about this and how to bridge the double empathy problem to talk about this with a group of people who's being thwarted by the healthcare system and yet has this enormous task of unlearning to do while trying to meet their own access needs and survive in the world. Um, and um, we'll also um, be discussing a little bit more about our model of healthcare here at All Brains Belong and some practical aspects that like aren't that hard, aren't that hard to carry out. So thank you. Thank you all so much for being here and being part of our community. We look forward to seeing you next week.